Good morning, everyone on Zoom and YouTube. Welcome to NPARC's Spotlight. My name is Leslie, and I'm from the National Biodiversity Centre at the National Parks Board. We have been celebrating our Festival of Biodiversity. This is NPARC's yearly celebration of our natural heritage, organised in collaboration with the Biodiversity Roundtable. Our first e-festival runs till 26 September, and we have a varied lineup of activities that you can do online or at home, such as biodiversity webinars and arts and crafts. For more details, visit nparks.gov.sg slash festival of biodiversity. This month on NPARC Spotlight, we have been joined by our partners from the biodiversity community. So far, we've heard from the Herpetological Society of Singapore, Friends of Marine Park and Raffles Bandit Langer Working Group. The recordings for these sessions are on our YouTube channel, so do check them out if you miss them. We'll be online once more next Saturday from 10.30 to 11.30, so do join us on Zoom or YouTube. Today, we have not just one, but two speakers with us, and they are both the authors of Singapore's very first guidebook on bees, produced as a collaboration between NPARCS and the National University of Singapore. It is also the first comprehensive guide on bees of any country in Southeast Asia. I'm sure our speakers, Zestin So and John Asher, are excited to tell you more, but first... Here is our program. Those on Zoom, if you have any questions during the talk, do send them to me, Leslie, as a private message, and we'll try to address a few of them during the Q&A later on. And now, let's welcome Zestin So, Senior Manager of the Horticulture and Operations Branch at the Botanic Gardens, at the Singapore Botanic Gardens, as well as Assistant Professor John Asher from the National University of Singapore presenting Wild Bees as Watchable Wildlife in Singapore. Take it away, Zestin and John. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us on Zoom and on YouTube this morning. So when we think of wildlife watching in Singapore, the first animals that are likely to come to mind are the birds, the butterflies, and the dragonflies. These are diverse and beautiful animals with an interesting array of behaviors. And they're often a very welcome sight as well because their presence of the species often means uh, that the ecosystem is healthy. Because of these reasons and more, these animals are popular for wildlife watching and lots of nature enthusiasts enjoy watching them very much. But today, uh, while we love these animals as well, John and I would love to share with you why bees are equally as interesting and worthwhile of your attention, and hopefully get some of you in the audience to start watching them and observing them during your next visit to a park or nature reserve. In order to start watching any wildlife effectively though, it's helpful to have a resource to identify them and understand them in the field. So we're happy to share with you that uh, the first guide to the bees of Singapore was recently launched earlier this month uh, by Minister Desmond Lee during the opening of the e-festival of biodiversity. So uh, much, about, much of this talk today will be about this book, uh, will be from this book, and we'll be sharing a lot about this book more later on. So this is where we'll be going for today. Uh, when, uh, bees aren't often thought about as uh, wildlife worth watching. So I'll, share, I'll start off by sharing three big reasons why we think it's a great idea to start doing so. Uh, just a disclaimer, uh, if you attended my talk uh, just last month on uh, NPARC Spotlight about bees, some of the information here may be repeated for context on, about bees in Singapore. Next though, uh, John will be sharing with us the journey of bee research in Singapore across the last 160 years and uh, bringing us to where we are today. He'll also take us through uh, the four major bee habitats found in Singapore, four major types of bee habitats in Singapore, as well as the interesting species that can be found there and the unique behaviors and adaptations. Uh, finally, I'll wrap up the talk by sharing some tips on how to begin watching bees and, and observing them in our natural environments. So why are bees worth watching? Now, the first reason is that bees are essential workers in Singapore. 
Um, so on the top left, you can see uh, some uh, image of brinjals. And uh, these are just, just one example of a vegetable or fruit, fruited vegetable that's pollinated by bees. And it's quite likely that many of us know that bees are important for food production and agriculture. And many of the fruits and vegetables that we enjoy rely on bee pollination. And our supermarkets will have a lot less variety and diversity if not for bees. But we often think that this important service that bees play happens only overseas. Well, actually right here in Singapore in our backyards, uh, bees are playing this exact same role. So if you visit your local community garden or an allotment garden like in Hot Park, like in this image on the bottom left, you're likely to see a diverse array of bees visiting the different fruits and vegetables that are being grown. And these uh, range from uh, plants such as watermelon to chilies to pumpkin to even sunflower. So without these bees, a lot of our local gardens wouldn't be as productive and bees are needed in order to have a good harvest of crop. But uh, more importantly though, bees are essential for supporting our biodiversity, the health of our ecosystem, especially here in our city and nature. Many of our native plants that are found in different habitats uh, rely on bee pollination for reproduction and in order to sustain their populations. Uh, these include uh, locally threatened plants uh, that are found, for example, in mangroves, such as this sea holly on the top left, as well as this seashore adesia. It also includes plants in our lowland dipterocarp forests, such as tiger orchids, which is uh, actually nationally extinct, but we are reintroducing and conserving through the orchid conservation program. It also includes uh, plants in our swamp forests, inc including aquatic plants, such as this water gentian, uh, which we might not think of as relying on bees. So bees pollinate these plants and help them to reproduce, but they also allow these plants to bear fruit. And a lot of these fruit will go then go on to support uh, birds and mammals, such as this native pink neck green pigeon. Um, and, and so indirectly, bees support these larger animals as well. Uh, but perhaps most exciting, bees are uh, have also been found in supporting entire habitats and forest patches. And this is illustrated through a study done uh, by NUS looking at this particular tree species that's locally endangered in Singapore, known as Kempas or Compasia malacensis. So the researchers uh, looked at these trees found in different forest patches, and they found that the trees more, were more genetically diverse than expected. And they, and they attributed it to the role of giant honeybees that were flying between these forest patches and pollinating these trees. So as we think about our building and transforming into a city in nature, we want to strengthen and protect our core biodiversity areas. And one of the ways we're doing that is setting up a network of nature parks. And so bees are our allies and in this effort as they help to uh, improve ecological connectivity by flying between these forest patches and pollinating the plants there, thereby supporting entire habitats as well as native biodiversity. And the reason why bees are so important and so good at uh, in doing these roles is that they are excellent at pollination. In fact, scientists often consider them as the most important group of pollinators. Uh, one of the reasons why they are so good is that they have structures that enable them to carry pollen. So if you zoom in close to a bee, uh, like using a microscope, you often notice that it contains hairs that look like feathers. So these are what, what we call branched hairs and they allow them to pick up pollen. And but through carrying pollen and picking up lots of it and flying between flowers, they pollinate the different flowers. In addition to structures though, bees also have interesting behaviors and abilities. One of them is shown here in this video, it's known as buzz pollination. And this is a special ability of only certain species of bees, such as this large carpenter bee you see in the video. So I'll play it one more time. So the bee is, visit, is, fly, is flying around this flower and is about to visit it. And when it lands on it, it buzzes at a very special frequency that causes all the pollen to be released. And without this special buzzing action, the flower actually doesn't release the pollen and won't be pollinated. So uh, pollination can only be performed by certain kinds of visitors. And in this case, a buzz pollinating bee. Another reason why bees are so worth watching is their diversity. But, but when we often think of bees, this species on the bottom left often comes to mind. That's, uh, this one is the Asian honeybee. So we usually just think of honeybees and 
not often other species of bee. But uh, the truth is that in Singapore alone, there's a huge diversity of bee species uh, with 132 bee species and counting. So you can see here that they come in a wide range of different colors, sizes, and shapes. And we're sharing a bit more about these. So, when, so one way that bees are diverse is in their color. So we often think of them as black, just black and yellow because uh, we're familiar with the honeybee. But in fact, bees come in an array of different colors, including most excitingly perhaps blue color, but as well as red and green and yellow um, and different co combinations of these colors. So they can be equally beautiful and diverse as bees, as, sorry, as, as birds or as butterflies. Bees are also diverse in other ways, including their size. So in the top left image, you can see three different bee species visiting the same flower. Uh, the bottom left, the biggest bee that can be found in Singapore, the broad-handed carpenter bee, as well as two smaller bee species, uh, the pearly banded bee, as well as this species of stingless bee. And you can see they come really in all sorts of sizes and shapes. Uh, bees are also diverse in activity. Uh, although we're familiar with the the bees that fly in the daytime, there are also some that also fly only at night. And one example is the Sunda night carpenter bee. This species is found in our forest and will visit night blooming trees. So what's interesting about this species, uh, if you look between its compound eyes, are these uh, enlarged uh, circles in the middle. And these are simple lenses known as ocelli. These, uh, in this species of bee, uh, these ocelli or ocelli are actually much larger and that allows them to take in more light and navigate, for example, uh, and, in low light conditions or just using the moonlight. Bees are also diverse in the food and nesting resources that they need. Um, so one example of this in the bottom left is the red-waisted grassnomia. Uh, this species is a specialist of grasses. So often you'll find it in parks visiting inflorescence of, of uh, tall grasses. And it's quite interesting because grass is uh, well known to be wind pollinated, but these bees uh, visit them and they can actually possibly provide a supplementary pollination um, effort to these plants. Bees also use an array of different interesting resources for nesting. And perhaps the most interesting to me is the, the, the leaf cutter bees, which will cut pieces of leaves and carry them back to the nest. Uh, John will share more about them later on. Another way that bees are diverse is in their social organization. Uh, we often are just familiar with the honeybees and think of bees as uh, very social creatures that live in big colonies. This is true actually only for a minority of bee species uh, worldwide and in Singapore. The only two group of colonial bees in Singapore are the familiar honeybees as well as the stingless bees. These are less familiar, but they're related to honeybees and they're, form they're found in tropical regions around the world. So these two groups of bees, they build hives and they make honey. Locally, there are about 17 species of these bees in Singapore. Actually, and the vast majority of the different bees are in fact non-colonial bees. So these bees, uh, as you can see here, uh, they may not look like honeybees or singless bees, but uh, they are different kinds of bees and they are solitary, semi-social or cuckoo bees. These bees do not build hives. Um, they don't make honey and they don't live in big groups. And altogether, there are about over 120 species of these bees. So this is just one of the interesting ways that bees are surprising. Uh, so I mentioned solitary bees. So these actually form the bulk of those uh, lesser known bees. Uh, so solitary bees, uh, in solitary bee species, a single female bee does all the work of uh, building the nest, uh, providing for the young, visiting flowers and collecting pollen and nectar to feed her young. So uh, these bees may build their nests in different environments and different substrates. So for example, uh, many solitary bees nest in the ground. So about 40% of the bees in Singapore will find um, clay substrate or uh, even sand and they'll build a burrow in it and that's where they'll nest. Some solitary bees also nest in wood or in stems. So stems that have been broken off, uh, they will bury in through the pits and form a, nest, form a nesting site. Um, other bees, they don't build a nest, uh, they don't excavate a nest uh, entrance, but instead they will use pre-existing cavities. And one example of these are the leaf cutter bees, as you can see here, uh, nesting in a bee hotel, which we'll share more about later on as well. 
So I mentioned that the female bees do the work of uh, collecting, the, the, um, tending to the nest and collecting food for the young. Uh, what do the males do? Uh, well, uh, their main role is really to find a mate. So one, uh, here's one example of a, of a carpenter bee, a white-cheeked white carpenter bee. And what he's doing is um, doing his rounds. He's um, patrolling a circuit that is his territory. And he will defend it from other males. And he'll often he'll keep rounding this territory and looking for female bees. So this is one of the interesting behaviors that you can uh, often see in bees when you're watching them. It's one of the fascinating things uh, you can enjoy when you're watching bees in the environment. As male bees, uh, as male solitary bees are not involved in building the nest, uh, they also often don't get to sleep in it. So at night, uh, you'll find male solitary bees roosting outdoors. So on the left here, there are these Sunda blue banded digger bees. Uh, these male bees are, um, are resting on uh, a root of a fig tree and they're just hanging onto it with their mandibles. And on the right, uh, these striped nomias or striped pearly banded bees, uh, they've also gathered on a little branch. So uh, interesting ways that uh, solitary bees live. Uh, another fascinating group of bees in Singapore are known as the cuckoo bees. These bees are similar to the cuckoo birds in that they don't build their own nest, but instead they rely on a host species to build a nest for them. So they, uh, what they will do is that they will find the nest of the host species and they'll often sneak into it. They'll lay an egg there. Uh, and when their young emerge, the young will steal the provisions uh, gathered by the host mother bee. So there are different species of cuckoo bee in Singapore. Uh, here are just four kinds of bee and they're, found, they're actually found in uh, different families of bees. So on the top left is a sharp-tailed bee and she has a very pronounced ab um, tapered end to her abdomen and she uses this sharp end to pierce the nest of the leaf cutter bee hosts and to lay her eggs in them. Uh, over here is a cloak and dagger bee. It's a very beautiful blue species um, and it's very common in urban environments. John will share more about that later on too. And bottom left, there's a chili-tailed bee and the blood bee, and these bees have a beautiful bright red abdomen. They often also have a very, sh um, uh, they're often protected by uh, integument. Um, their outer covering is often very armored and that allows them to protect, that protects them from um, the host bee uh, that's trying to defend the nest. And finally, perhaps the, what will come to a relief to many of us is that actually bees are really safe creatures to watch. Uh, the majority of bee species found worldwide and in Singapore are in fact docile and unaggressive, even at their nests. So many of the bees that I just talked about, the, the solitary bees, the semi-social bees, and the cuckoo bees, uh, these bees, um, if you were to approach them or even disturb them by accident, um, the first thing they'll do is to flee. So they are really docile and they are, there's almost zero likelihood of being stung by them unless you were to grab them and hold them um, in your hands. So John and I, uh, we spent maybe collectively over 30 years uh, watching bees in the field and often getting very close to their nests, just as in this photo, uh, photo over here on the right. And uh, we haven't been close to being stung by these bees because it, they are truly docile and unaggressive. The one exception to this rule though, are the honeybees. So in Singapore, we have four species of honeybee out of the 132 bee species found in Singapore. And these honeybees do behave differently when they're disturbed at the nest. So what they will do is they will defend themselves and uh, they will, they will uh, swarm and they will sting any intruder. And that's why beekeepers uh, who are working with honeybees, they need to wear bee suits to protect themselves uh, from honeybee stings. So honeybees, the reason why they behave this way is because they have a lot of predators that are after their honey or their brood. And these predators are often uh, mammals or birds such as uh, mammals in the case of sun bears or honey badgers or uh, birds like the honey uh, oriental honey buzzard which uh, John will share about later on as well. So these birds and mammals they will attack the honeybees and so these honeybees have uh, adapted to defend themselves by um, being very defensive at the nest. So it is important to know that honeybees uh, shouldn't be disturbed when they're at their nest as they will de defend themselves. So this is an exception to the rule. But though when it comes to watching bees in the field, 
uh, you'll be glad to know that honeybees, just like all bees, they are actually placid and docile when they're out foraging and away at the nest, uh, from, and away from their nest. So even this honeybee, for example, that's on my arm, she's trying to forage from some salts um, on, from my sweat. Uh, she doesn't mean any harm. And uh, just like butterflies, they will often fly and land on you to drink your sweat after, if you, uh, after uh, a walk in the, in the park or, or in the forest. And uh, this bee doesn't mean any harm and she will actually fly off um, if I were to just gently move her off. And likewise for this bee that's visiting this long -an flower. Um, so uh, bees are, in fact, as well as honeybees, all bees are safe to watch in the garden. And when you're around, around them and seeing them on flowers, uh, they're just as safe as butterflies or birds. So no worries about uh, any safety issues there. So I've given three big reasons why I think bees are worth watching. Now John will share with us uh, bee research through the years, uh, over the last 160 years, bringing us to where we are today. John, please. Okay, thanks, Estin, and, and thank you, uh, Leslie, for hosting. Uh, hi, I'm John Asher from National, National University of Singapore, Department of Biological Sciences. And I've been in Singapore since 2013 and doing a lot of bee research. And I will give you some examples here in this slide, uh, starting from the upper left. When we do our research, a lot of it is in museums. And it's not just the Lee Kong Chan Natural History Museum here in Singapore. It's also an array of museums regionally and globally. So here I'm visiting with the team, uh, the National Museum in Indonesia at Bogor. And by doing this type of extensive checking of museums, we're able to verify the names and the distributions, not just in Singapore, but across the whole range of the different species and cross check with what other, uh, other experts have uh, determined over the, over the years and even uh, decades. So then the next one to the right of that is a bio blitz at Kent Ridge Park. And this is an example of not just outreach, but also genuine scientific discovery. We actually, during the course of these events, um, in this case, discovered some new species for Singapore and new species for science of leaf cutter bees and their parasites. And then the bottom uh, right, we took the team to Malaysia and we're meeting with our colleagues there who are advancing melipona culture. So this is using stingless honeybees to produce honey and resin and hive products uh, which are actually very valuable uh, for uh, commercial sales across Asia and also uh, globally. And finally, it's a great research opportunity to meet with the Malaysian experts. So this is how we put things in the context. And then the, the lower uh, middle part is showing uh, undergraduate honors students in my lab at NUS. And they, these are uh, some of the folks who did a lot of the technical research on the taxonomy, the ecology and uh, statistics uh, that, that are underpinning our bee guide and, and some of the things we're presenting here. And then the lower left is an example of outreach where particularly at the bee trail in Hort Park, uh, we're able to sort of combine uh, 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 public education and also uh, uh, research and observations in, in one uh, venue. So bee research has a long and illustrious history. Uh, it started out uh, in a very good way with Alfred Russell Wallace when he was based at the little church near Bukatima. He went out in the local forest and he was mostly looking for beetles, but he discovered a wide array of stingless uh, honeybees, some of which were new to science. And so we, we can have that as a baseline to compare with what we find today. And he discovered these four species of solitary bees, the very spectacular cerulean carpenter, the blue one, and broad-handed, and all of these we can still find today. So we can show persistence of the same species that he was uh, finding. But he only found a, a very few species because he was really looking for beetles. So uh, the next major uh, phase of bee research in Singapore took place based at the Singapore Botanic Garden. And it was initially led by Henry Nicholas Ridley, who is the famous Mad Ridley who introduced rubber through uh, Malay Peninsula and had a huge economic impact on the region, but he also had a particular interest in pollination. And so he was looking at bees and other insects that were pollinating in the Singapore Botanic Garden. And in the process, he collected a lot of bees, including the one shown at the upper right, which is actually a type specimen in the British Museum. So one thing that's underpinning our research was uh, Zestin going to this museum, photographing the specimens, and then we could compare them with the same species that we find today in Singapore. So you see an orange bee there called the Island Forest Digger. Uh, I was able to find this uh, visiting gingers at Bukatima and Zestin got some lovely photos. 
And so we can show the exact uh, B that was initially discovered in, in Singapore from the type specimen more than 100 and uh, 100, almost 120 years later, it's still uh, visiting the same uh, forest patch or a very nearby forest patch. And then uh, to the right, you can see uh, Ridley small carpenter. It's an example of a bee species that he discovered and was named after him. It's a patronym. And then in the middle is the gentleman there is uh, Charles Fuller Baker, who was in Singapore only briefly, but he had a great passion for uh, the forest bees of Singapore. And so he brought these back to the museums in London and the United States National Museum in Washington, DC. And these were described as new species by Cockerell, who's the world's most prolific describer of bees. So uh, Singapore had a very active period there around the 1910s, 1920s of bee discovery. And then there was sort of a fallow period of not much activity. And then Patty Murphy uh, made very extensive collections of insects across Singapore. He did particularly important work in the mangrove as he was the first person to really survey bees there. And he did uh, some important things of documenting persistence of some of the forest specialist bees that Wallace had found and that those other Singapore Botanic Garden folks had refound. And he showed that they were still present into the 1970s at Bukatima. And then later uh, we made a resurvey of Bukatima to show the current status at that site as kind of a conservation assessment. And then finally, he did a lot of work on discovering cryptic species at places like Bukatima, and he found some of the harder to locate species like these um, cuckoo bee, the Malay nomad. And in this way, he laid the foundation for uh, conservation and status assessments of modern Singapore just before the period of major industrialization or urbanization. Okay, so this shows uh, uh, a recent uptick which has come out of uh, bee studies that started with uh, Zestin and colleagues at N Parks and then continued uh, with, in collaboration with what we do at NUS. And we've been able to discover a remarkably large number of species on the order of maybe 30 uh, just in the past uh, 10 years or so. And some of these are quite spectacular. So we've got in the upper left, a Singapore blue mass bee, a very unusual blue hyleus bee which uh, showed up in malaise traps in the mangroves. So we've also partnered with the mangrove insect project as well. And then the upper right is a beach bee that had been overlooked because it's uh, only on the beaches. And then we've had some exotic bees which are spreading down like the red dwarf honeybee, which came originally from Thailand and is now spread to Singapore. And then we've also located some of the more seasonal bees like the resin bees there that only fly uh, at certain favorable times of year during bloom periods. And then some of the minute bees like the Kuala Lumpur sweat bee that's associated with sand and so might have been overlooked for those reasons. So one of the big challenges that we faced was separating the cryptic species. So when I arrived in Singapore, the local understanding was that there was a bee called Xylocopa uh, confusa, the appropriately named confusing uh, carpenter bee. But after very much study, we were able to determine that there are actually two common species of these yellow and black uh, carpenter bees in Singapore. So this was led by some student work and uh, uh, we were able to find subtle morphological characters like the white cheeks of the white cheek carpenter, uh, some of these uh, position and density of yellow hairs and also the wing color and size. And uh, crucially, we're able to confirm this with DNA barcodes and also population genomics in association with the bird lab. We got uh, genomic data and all this together indicates uh, two species. So after much work, we're able to separate the species. And then from there, we can do the ecological and behavioral research. So this is uh, just about, I would say, the most exciting discovery of the recent period of bee research. And this was initially made by Zestin. Uh, during a mass bloom period in 2004 after the drought, when some restored plantings of the world's largest orchid, the tiger orchid, started blooming in Singapore parks. And when this happened, uh, Zestin noticed that you've got uh, these resin and leaf cutter bees, and they came sort of in two colors. There's the black with the orange wings, which are often found in the forests, and then there's also the black and the white uh, version. And rather than the expected one or two species, he found an array of additional species, some of which were new to Singapore and some of which had been undetected since the early days of uh, maybe a hundred years ago. And so uh, 
From this, it expanded out to a pollination study in collaboration with Dr. Yam of Singapore Botanic Garden and others. And uh, we were able to document in detail which uh, species of bees visit the tiger orchid and their size distribution and also their behavior on the flowers. So in this case, you can see the middle photo shows the pollinia or the pollen mass of the orchid, which is affixed, it's glued to the back of this bee. And then this bee is going to visit a different tiger orchid and the pollen mass will be stuck to the stigma of that new plant and it will affect uh, pollination. So it's an interesting guild of, of mimetic bees that are the, the uh, turns out to be the real pollinators of tiger orchids. And interestingly, there were some sort of uh, contradictory observations by the early workers. So we made a bunch of original discoveries here and the mimicry is something to fool the birds. So the birds learn to avoid these colorful bees and then they, next time they encounter one, if they've been stung the first time, they'll avoid any bees of that color. So we get a whole guild of species that look the same. And you can see the need for detailed taxonomy because superficially it looks like one, uh, just two species, but it's actually six or seven. And Singapore, it turns out, has species that are uniquely known from Singapore. It's possible that they're also in Sumatra and Peninsular Malaysia, but those areas are quite poorly surveyed. So Singapore is actually a well-known uh, spot of uh, biodiversity discovery in this region. And some of them have been overlooked uh, maybe because they're so small. So there's a bee called Singapore plume vented bee, which unlike other sweat bees has a lot of dense plume, plumose hairs and carries the pollen under the abdomen. And then one of the most interesting one is this red tailed comb sweat bee that is known only from Bukatima Nature Reserve. And we have not found it recently. So this is a species of top conservation concern. So we gave it the highest uh, conservation category in, in our uh, conservation assessment of Singapore, which is ongoing. And so now I'll talk about bee habitats in Singapore. You can find bees across Singapore, including this uh, pearly banded nomia or striped nomia. And these will visit a wide array of flowers. So I'll try to explain how the bees are distributed and where you can find special bees. One place remarkably that you can find a large number of bees is on rooftop gardens. So it turns out that whether these are planted with edible garden flowers or whether they're growing up in weeds, they attract a lot of bees. So initially it was thought that the bees, how can the bees fly up to the, reach these high uh, heights of the top of rooftops? But it turns out uh, from recent work that, that Zestin, Zestin's been doing that some of them are actually nesting in the soils of the rooftops. And so it can sustain a, a pollinator guild within the rooftop it's, itself. And they are gonna be uh, pollinating pumpkins, beans, and other edible garden crops at these sites. And uh, there are some bees that are particularly well adapted to the urban matrix. And this includes the resin bees. Uh, we found them nesting in interesting places. Here it's showing they're uh, visiting a pole, a bamboo pole of a, uh, used for a laundry line. And they're also visiting drainage holes in windows, window sills. And this can be as high as 19 floors up in the, in the flats or even higher. And this can be in a truly urban matrix. Uh, a student of mine uh, in entomology class found them nesting in the climbing wall at NUS at our university. So these bees are highly adaptable and by nesting in these holes, they're able to live uh, well within the urban matrix and have a very short flight to get to the rooftop gardens. And when you find their nests, there's a chance to observe interesting behavior. It's called the resin bee because she closes her nests and provides a, a, a rim around her nest of resin, and it may have many functions to also repel ants and other unwanted visitors. And uh, unfortunately for the resin bee, she has to make a last trip to gather resin to close her nest. And at that time, it's a window of opportunity for this chili tail bee, a parasitic bee or a cuckoo bee to sneak in and lay her egg. And then her larvae will develop at the expense of the resin bee as a cuckoo. And so uh, this, uh, this cuckoo bee or the chili tail bee is actually armored. So as Zestin already mentioned, if the host bee were to come back and try to sting her, uh, it would be repelled by the armor plating of the cuckoo. And then I also wanna emphasize the fact that this, uh, 
Bee Trail at the Hort Park is not only an education and outreach opportunity, but also a research opportunity because it's at this site, which is set up for the public that, uh, that these bees are observed doing this behavior. And uh, park land can be very good for bees because bees are often associated with what we call early successional habitat and they're very good dispersers. And so at places like Badok Town Park, if you make an extensive planting of, of flowers, whether it's native flowers or otherwise or ornamental, uh, bees will very quickly find it. And you can find some of the most beautiful species like the blue banded digger bee and its blue parasite, the cloak and dagger bee uh, living uh, together on these flowers. Uh, one challenge I want to pose to the public is to try to locate the nests of these digger bees. The, we see the bees themselves all the time. They're very conspicuous, but for some reason we just can't find the nests. So if anybody can do that, that would be very exciting. Please, please do your best. And then we can also see uh, leaf, leaf cutter bees as well. Regarding the blue color, I want to point out that uh, we're doing a collaboration with a biophysicist at Yale and US to study how they physically produce uh, this, this color. Um, Parklands are also an opportunity uh, to observe uh, uh, bees nesting, and you can see the pith nesters, the emerald carpenter bee, which likes to visit the melastoma flowers, will go into the, the soft pith within twigs and build its nest. And there are also reed bees, the appropriately na named reed bees, and they actually have amazing social behavior and interactions between the female and the brood within these, these very narrow nests. So the narrow body of the bee allows it to fit within the narrow twigs. Uh, forest habitats have some of the most special and interesting bees of Singapore. And they're also a site for nesting of Apis dorsata, the giant honeybee. And here we can see members of the public are observing this U-shaped nest on the top of a, a canopy tree or a large tree at the quarry at the base of Bukatima. And Normally these bees, even though potentially they, they can pose a, a highly defensive stinging threat, um, you're, normally they're out of reach way up high in the trees. But what can happen is oriental honey buzzards are known to attack the nest and rake them with their talons, knock down the brood, and then they can gobble up the brood and the, and the honey. And uh, when they do this, of course, it provokes an extreme defense by the giant honeybee. So there's actually some interesting species interactions with the predators of bees as well. And that would also extend to bee eaters, which are quite common in Singapore. And uh, forest habitats have some of the most special bees of Singapore. I already mentioned a few of them and here I'm showing them again, the Island Forest Digger and Ridley's Bee. Uh, Bukatimas and Dairy Farm are particularly important for this. And there's some, some interesting forest bees also in the scrub forest, for example, at Kent Ridge Park. And this is a chance when the tube tube trees are blooming, you can walk along the canopy walkway and uh, normally the bees are too high to see, but in this case, you can see them at sort of uh, eye level and watch these wonderful blue bees, usually in the evening around 7 p.m. or so, just when it's starting to get uh, a little bit dark, the bees will come out in large numbers and it's quite a beautiful sight. So I encourage you to, to go check them out. Notice the blue bee was also featured on a stamp uh, historically in Singapore. Uh, coastal habitats are some of the places where we can expect to make the most new discoveries. Uh, some amazing bees have shown up in malaise traps, which is like putting up a tent in the mangrove. And these are, are, many of them are new to science or new to Singapore, but they have never been observed and their behavior is unknown. So we need to go to these sites more. Uh, near Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve, there's some sites that are opening up or will soon, where you can find the sea holly, which is on the left of the trail here. And if you look in detail, there are leafcutter bees uh, visiting them, but also a very special nomia bee or pearly banded bee, which is only found in this mangrove habitat. And it turns out there's uh, interesting discoveries to be made about its taxonomy as well. So this sea holly is pollinated by these bees by putting its pollen onto the back of the bee uh, due to the position of the uh, sta uh, stamens. Uh, one thing to look out for in these back mangrove habitats are cuts made by the leaf cutter bees. So they use their jaws to cut different shaped uh, holes or, or semicircles out of the leaf. If it's perfectly semicircular, that might be the capping, uh, the, the closure of the, the cell, the end of the cell, and the sides of the cell are made by these longer 
uh, cuts, more elliptical cuts. Here we can see the behavior of the bee. She lands uh, and using her knife-like uh, mandibles, she'll cut the leaves. You can see in the video, the action. It's quite remarkable. And she's really good at gathering up the leaf between her legs and then she can carry it back once it's free uh, back to the nest and then uses it for her origami-like nest construction. I should add, we've done a, a careful study of uh, one of the uh, student, uh, Eunice uh, So did a, led a study of the, what leaves they use in Singapore and made many discoveries there. So uh, what they're doing is carrying it back. They fold up an, an individual uh, folded cell for each larvae. If you look at the photo of the bee, uh, you can see how they do their pollination. This bee, when they visit bean flowers or legumes, the stamens are coming up from beneath the bee and they contact a pollen brush underneath the tail or the abdomen of the bee. You can see it's filled with pollen. And then of course they will pollinate when they visit the next uh, plant down the line and its uh, stigma will contact that big brush of pollen. So, so the, the, when you have bean flowers, these leaf cutters are very effective, well-adapted pollinators with the right morphology to peel open those petals and uh, contact the, uh, reproductive parts of the plant. Um, now, most of the leafcutter bees will nest in pre-existing cavities, but there's a very special case that we discovered in the mangroves of Singapore. And this is the so-called orange-winged leafcutter bee, one of this mimicry group that, that pollinates the tiger orchid. And in this case, the bee has a challenge of how does it keep its nest dry? The tide is coming in with salt water, how does it remain uh, dry and, and how does it find nice soil for digging? And it turns out that uh, in the case of, of Singapore, our, our famous mud lobster has made a wonderful volcano or a, a, a volcano shaped mound of, of dirt, which is very easy to dig. And this leaf cutter bee digs into the soil and then puts her uh, folded up leaves within here. And when we find these sites, we can do some really fun studies of sort of a day in the life of the bee we can follow her as she emerges from her nest in the morning when she wakes up. Uh, we can see her pollen collecting trips going in and out. And then she has trips where she brings the leaves back to fold up the nest. And then when, when she's all done with that, she has to excavate uh, more side tunnels in the nest to, to uh, make a new cells. And uh, there are special bees on the offshore islands of Singapore. So Singapore itself is a, a fairly decent sized island, but then there's small islands that have special species that we don't find in the mainland. One of the most interesting is this beautiful gold margin stingless bee. We can see they make a wonderful nest entrance and there's a bunch of guard bees defending it here. And they're often seen at Chek Jawa, which is a remnant mangrove uh, at, at an offshore island called Pulau Ubin. And at this site, you can see them visiting palm inflorescences like here. They're, it's quite a beautiful site due to the gold uh, gold uh, hairs on the back of the bee. So this is a, a special species which lives there and also at Pulau Takong, the offshore islands of Singapore. At these islands, we can also find special beach bees. They like to nest in sand. And here uh, at this site, if you look in the beach morning glory within the corolla tube, you might find one of these special bees. Some of them have long tongues for sipping nectar out of this deep uh, tube. Uh, plant. Uh, the beach uh, comb sweat bee was one of the discoveries from our, our recent surveys of these offshore islands, such as St. John's Island and other, other such islands. The, uh, sorry, the step bee uh, nest in the sand. And a very interesting discovery that I think Zestin made was that in addition to the beach, they also use sand inland at like sand, sand pits in parks in addition to the beach sand. So they're uh, what we call a nest substrate specialist. Okay, thanks. Uh, now, now Zestin can give some tips for how to watch and, and locate bees. Thanks, John. Uh, so we've heard a lot about the exciting bee species in the, in the variety of habitats found in Singapore. So how can we begin watching them? 
Well, the first thing you want to do is to go out on a sunny morning and visit one of the habitats that John shared about. So uh, sunny morning, uh, you want to go in the morning because that's when bees are most active and especially um, when it's dry and hot. After a rain, usually the flowers are wet and the pollen uh, is not so easily collected by the bees. So they don't often, so they don't, they may not bother to go out and fly and collect pollen. The next thing to do when bees are most active is to find a patch of flowers, uh, go close to it and take a closer look at what might be visiting them. So we find that this is a, a better way of uh, getting to see bees up close rather than chasing them around. Um, just by sitting quietly near a flower, uh, often uh, invites them to visit it. And when they pause to visit the flower, that's when you can take a good look at them. So uh, bees visit a wide range of flowers, as John has mentioned. Uh, these include natives, edibles, and ornamentals, but also plants that are often grown to attract butterflies. Uh, these will support a wider range of bees as well. So all these flowers, flowering plants are worth watching and looking for bees at. The next thing you want to do is be patient. Uh, sometimes the bees may take some time to visit your, the flower that you're watching and avoid sudden movements because uh, bees are very timid. They have a lot of predators. So uh, by watching and staying still, uh, you can invite the bee to come closer and you, that's when you can take a look at it. Uh, some things that are useful and good to have with you when watching bees are uh, binoculars, especially close focal, close focus binoculars or a camera with a macro lens to allow you to take uh, images or a closer look at these species. Uh, if you're really passionate about bee conservation and bee watching, uh, one thing we'd recommend is setting up a bee hotel at your local community garden, for example. So bee hotels are simply uh, nesting sites for solitary bees that naturally use pre-existing cavities in the environment. So uh, by offering these sites, uh, bees will use them to, as nesting for nesting. And some of the bees that use bee hotels are, uh, include resin bees uh, that John shared about, as well as uh, leaf cutter bees. So building a bee hotel is not difficult, it's quite simple. And we've, uh, we've also done a video on how you can do so and it's accessible on the M Parks Facebook page. So uh, do consider building one of these Airbnbs for yourself. If you're not sure where to start looking for bees, uh, we'd highly recommend visiting the Hort Park Bee Trail. So this is a place that I was set up uh, in 2018 and it's dedicated to the conservation and education of native bees. So here you can find um, some examples of bee hotels that have also been uh, used as signs for, that you can read up and learn more about bees and their, and their habitats. And it also features uh, representations of three distinct bee habitats in Singapore, uh, native habitats, um, urban gardens, as well as edible gardens. And it showcases the different roles of bees uh, that they play in each of these environments. And so far we've recorded over 40 bee species along the bee trail. And uh, with you watching there uh, and going to look for bees, who knows, we're likely to record even more species. So once you're out there and going about observing and documenting these interesting species, uh, it's a good idea to start recording them. And uh, one of the ways you can do that is uh, through the SG Bio Atlas app. So you can use these uh, QR code links. Uh, you can scan these QR codes to go to the link to download these, uh, this app for free. And uh, this app will allow you to uh, record the species, uh, its photo, its location, and even the flowers that it's visiting. And this information will be passed on to scientists and it can help provide information on the distribution and as well as their ecology, for example, what flowers they rely on and where, where, um, uh, whether they are specialized on particular habitats. And as mentioned at the start of this talk, uh, there are some new resources that are useful for you as you go about watching bees. So one of them is the first guide to the bees of Singapore. And this guidebook is available at the Singapore Botanic Gardens shop. Uh, there's 20% discount until uh, 30th September, the end of September. So um, this book uh, includes uh, detailed accounts to 90 different bee species in Singapore, it includes information on the habitats, uh, the floral resources that they require, as well as useful uh, simple uh, characters in order to identify and tell apart different species. 
Uh, a simple guide that you can access right now though is uh, found on the SG Bio Atlas app. Um, you can download this for free and it features 30 of the most common bee species in Singapore. Yep, so that's all we have this morning. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll now pass on the time for, uh, to Leslie for some Q&A. Thank you, Zestin and John. Both of you shared some very interesting observations of our local bees and gave us some insights into the process of researching these fascinating insects. So now we'll move on to our Q&A. So the first question I would like to present to John is, now that the Bee Guide has been published, what is next for bee research in Singapore? Um, John, you need to unmute your mic to answer the question. Okay, so uh, establishing our guide, it really is just a, a sort of a baseline. We need to know the cast of characters of who is in Singapore, how do we recognize them, and what do they do in a very general sense? What flowers do they visit? But some of the, some of the key things we need to know now is uh, information about their functional pollination. So how are they contributing in a quantitative sense or in, ex in an experimental sense to pollination of edible garden crops? And how exactly are they providing ecosystem services to our remnant native uh, forests? So we need to go from just knowing that they're visiting a particular plant, which we've already established, to really uh, having a detailed understanding of what that is. We've done some first steps towards that with buzz pollination studies, but we need to move on to an array of, I would say, ed edible garden pollination studies uh, we're looking at a whole different array of things. We're looking at the biophysics of how they produce the blue, blue color. We're doing uh, studies of their nesting uh, conservation assessment where we compare all of the historic data that we can find to our recent uh, observations and collections. Uh, we're expanding the citizen science, uh, trying to look not just at the bees, but associated organisms like uh, wasp parasites and other associated creatures. So bee, uh, B plant interactions, B insect interactions, and even B vertebrate interactions would be interesting too. So there's a, a whole array of things to look at. Okay, so I think you know the, the book is a great start. You know, now that we've got a comprehensive um, guide on what bees we have in Singapore, this opens up more doors to understanding them better. And you gave some examples of um, looking at the, the functions that they play and their relationships with other species. And if I may add, having a book now actually means um, bee research is a bit more accessible. So our audience here, you know, if you like what you've seen today, go and purchase the book. It's a really beautiful book. And it means that more of you can contribute to our understanding of bees in Singapore. So still lots more to be done and it's very exciting. Yeah, we Next hope it's out of date question. soon with all the new uh, <laughs> Yes. Okay, next question is, um, I'll, I think I'll also present this to John. How can we quickly differentiate bees from wasps and hornets? Um, are there like any key differences that we can look out for? Well, the, the, some of these are noted in the book itself in the introductory materials. Um, the bees have a modified hind leg often, which is broad for carrying pollen. So uh, usually if they're carrying pollen, that would indicate it's a bee. Under the microscope, the branched or plumose hairs that uh, Zestin noted, the bees tend to be hairier. Um, many of the wasps have, are very slender and uh, the behavior can be different as well. The wasps are not always, but a few of the wasp and hornets can be uh, even more aggressive than bees, but bees sometimes get the blame for that, which is a bit unfair. Um, it, it can, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time answering this because uh, some wasps look a great deal like bees and vice versa. And part of this is because they mimic each other. So they're trying to fool their bird and other uh, vertebrate predators uh, by visually resembling the other species. So uh, recognizing bees from wasps can be a bit tricky, but we sort of explain in, in, the, um, in the book some tips and really importantly show examples of some of the confusion species. So when you, when you see them, you'll know what it is. Okay, so I think uh, one key feature that you pointed out in, uh, in the case of bees is that they usually have some uh, features that help with, the, with pollination. So like hairs, for example. Okay. Yes, in, in particular, they often will have hairs okay. to carry uh, pollen. But in the case of honeybees, they have a pollen, what's called a pollen basket, which is a concave area fringed by hairs on the hind leg. So different species do it in different ways. The leaf cutters carry the hair under the abdomen but the male bees don't uh, carry pollen. So they can be 
a bit trickier to tell from wasps, but usually the bees tend to be hairier, except for maybe the large carpenter bees, but those are pretty distinctive in their shape and appearance. Okay, so there's quite a lot of differences depending on which species we're talking about. So perhaps a good idea would be for our audience members, you really want to know more, you want to brush up your ID skills, go and get the, the guidebook and learn more about the bees that we, and the bees that we have here in Singapore. Mm -hmm. The next question uh, I'll present to Zestinus, who was uh, asked, as the person asked it during your portion of the presentation. Can host bees recognize cuckoo bees as different species? And do they chase the cuckoo bees away? I, thanks for the question. Uh, I think they do. They do recognize that uh, cuckoo bees um, are different species. But because host bees, as we mentioned, are solitary. So uh, when it comes to solitary bees, they, they know they recognize their own nest and they know that everything else is going to be an intruder and is not really wanted there. So regardless of whether it's a cuckoo bee or another solitary bee just trying to steal resources and trying to co-op the nest or ants or maybe a lizard that's trying to make a home in its nest, uh, they will try to chase it away. But again, but I do think they have a special hatred for their cuckoo bee uh, parasites. And we have some videos also contributed by members of the public of showing some really interesting video, um, behavior of uh, defense where the cuckoo bee can be so where the host bee can be seen almost kicking the cuckoo bee away from the nest. So these interactions are, are quite fascinating and there's a lot more to learn. Uh, cuckoo bees, um, they rely entirely on the host species. They can't build their own nest. So um, in a way, cuckoo bees are, are always having a smaller population than the host because if the hosts are rarer, the, the, the cuckoo bees can't find as many nests and they will even have a smaller uh, population. So although cuckoo bees may seem like the enemies when it comes to bees, um, they are important and they are also uh, a useful indicator for the health of an ecosystem, a community of bees. So if you see cuckoo bees, it, it, it means that the, the bee community in the environment is actually quite healthy. So it's not all bad. Can I add something to that? Um, okay, sure. It turns out in, in uh, areas where the bees are really well known, such as Europe, they found amazing things about chemical mimicry between the cuckoo bees and their hosts. So the cuckoo bee has a trick to help hide its eggs and maybe its own presence by mimicking the uh, volatile lipids or the, chemi the chemicals of, that are produced by the host. The, the cuckoo can produce uh, similar smells and therefore uh, bees, uh, bees and other insects are really going a lot by scent. And so they, they can actually use scent to confuse their or trick their hosts or camouflage their, their eggs. Okay, so this is very fascinating indeed. So uh, in, in summary, yes, a host bees might be able to recognize the cuckoo bees as a, as a different species and they do show some like defensive behaviors. But that said, cuckoo bees, some of them have mechanisms to help them evade detection. There's lo and there's still lots more to learn and to understand about this very interesting relationship. Sure. So the, uh, it turns out in Singapore, many of the cuckoo bees, we, we're just discovering them for the first time. So many of them, we've only found a very few observations of them at all. And we've certainly never found the nest or observed the interaction. So that's something for the future. Okay. So like in the case of Singapore, these are some of the aspects which we might want to look into um, for further research. Next question. I will pose to Zestin, how can the general public get involved in bee conservation? Um, so in order to conserve bees better, we need to understand them. I think John has shared that a lot. Um, and one of the best ways would be to um, go out there, watch bees and contribute your sightings. So already um, we do have a number of people who are submitting uh, bee records regularly um, on uh, we have a Facebook group on, on bees, but also on SG Bio Atlas and on other platforms. So all these are providing really useful information on where, how bees are distributed, uh, whether they rely on a particular nesting resource or on, on flowering plants. And these are useful in conserving bees. So go out there and be a citizen scientist. That's really helpful. Another way would be to also improve habitats for bees and accessibility to those habitats. So if you are uh, part of a local community gardening group, uh, consider 
uh, lead some good pollinator um, friendly be, uh, practices, uh, plant a diverse array of plants you know, to support uh, pollinators and um, um, be um, more uh, be prudent in the way you use pesticides, for example. And some of these are some of these tips are, should, are shared in the bee guide. Okay, so a, a few key ways that you highlighted would be citizen science. Share your sightings on the SG BioAtlas app. And I think you've shown during the presentation how public contributions can be a valuable resource. And uh, I, our audience has heard from our researchers that they're still on the lookout for some sightings such as like the bigger bee nest or the, the cuckoo bee behavior. So do go out and look, look, look out for our bees and share their sightings with us. And also, support, you can support bee populations by planting a varied garden or even, like Zestin mentioned earlier, building a bee hotel. Okay. Finally, what is one takeaway from your conservation journey? Uh, I think we'll start with Zestin first. So, um, I think, uh, adding on to what I just mentioned, that we need to understand bees better. Uh, I think what's interesting uh, that I've discovered here in Singapore is that you don't need to be uh, actually have a lot of um, resources or background knowledge on bees in order to make a difference to conservation. I think you just need to um, be willing to observe. So willing, uh, some, a willingness to observe the things around you and also some curiosity, a willingness to ask questions about what you've just seen. And some of the most interesting and useful discoveries that uh, help conservation of, of bees and wildlife have been made in this way. So one example is um, some, some people that I met uh, uh, online who just shared with me that, um, just emailed me and shared that the, uh, they, they spotted bees nesting in their, um, their flower pots. And this is a way that we discovered uh, that actually bees could use this particular resource and it could be a way of conserving this, these species. Uh, whether it can help us, it can lead to more questions and discovering whether is it the soil that they use or the position of these pots. And later on, it can help us to enhance habitats and, and protect these particular species. And sometimes you might be just going around anywhere in the city, uh, in, in the city, uh, in city of nature where animals and wildlife are everywhere. Um, you might be doing exercise and, and somehow you discover that bees are using the, the sand in a fitness area. And that's how we realize that these species rely on this particular resource. So I think everyone can take a, play a part in conservation. You don't need to have a particular background or knowledge to do so. Just uh, keep asking questions and keep observing the things around you. Okay, and John? Okay, I mean, one thing that I'd like to highlight is the interdisciplinary nature of bee research and the really crucial importance of many different, different people to advancing the research. So in order to make the book and do any of the research we're talking about, it's taken a, a research, uh, researchers from, from uh, NPARCs, NUS, but also uh, overseas uh, curators at museums who share the information about type specimens uh, tons of citizen science information, including the venues that uh, iNaturalist, in addition to the ones that uh, Zestin has mentioned, and uh, also students at all levels, including even high school students who did a lot of uh, body size measurement for the bees for these studies. So uh, I would say it's a real team effort. And because we're at such an early stage in discovery of the insect fauna of Southeast Asia, there's a real chance and even a very high likelihood that if an interested member of the public goes out with a camera or makes observations, looks for nests and things like this, you can really make a surprising and, and interesting new discoveries. I think Zestin showed that with the tiger orchid uh, system, which turned out to be really fascinating and it was quite unexpected. Um, similar things are out there to be found. So I would encourage uh, everybody from the public to keep their eye out for uh, interesting and surprising bee behavior and to share that. And then we have a sort of an existing team who once we know that something interesting is happening. We can bring in uh, species distribution modeling from ecologists. We can bring in taxonomy. Uh, and even, as I said, we're getting into biophysics of the blue bees. So we're, we're exploring many different avenues, but we really need to make some basic discoveries like the nest of the digger bees and things like that before we can start doing the uh, detailed science. Thank you, John and Zestin. I think both of you summed it up very well. You know, discoveries can happen anytime, anywhere, and it really is a communal concerted effort. This wraps up our Q&A. Thank you, thank you both for answering our audience's questions. And of course, congratulations on the new book. 
So as we have seen from today's talk, the book is a culmination of years of hard work and contributions from not just researchers, but the community as well. But it is through research and collaborating with our partners that we gain a better understanding of our island's spectacular biodiversity. And this in turn guides our conservation efforts. Here at NParks, we have a systematic and holistic plan to conserve our biodiversity and transform Singapore into a city in nature. For more information, do check out the links being shared in the Zoom chat or watch the first NParks Spotlight Talk on YouTube to hear our group director, Lim Liang Jim, outline this plan. You can find all of our previous episodes of NParks Spotlight on our YouTube channel as well, so be sure to check them out. And if you enjoy these sessions, do share them with your friends and family. This coming Saturday, 26 September, we'll be joined by Bernard Xia, a volunteer with the Otter Working Group and a talented wildlife photographer. Throughout the N Park Spotlight series, we've learned about some amazing biodiversity. And if you're inspired to go out and capture some spectacular moments for yourselves, then this is the talk for you. Our speaker has photographed saltwater crocodiles, hawksbill turtles, smooth-coated otters, and much more. So join us to hear his tips and insights in capturing wild moments. The registration link for this upcoming talk will be sent in the chat. And don't forget that we've got more biodiversity activities until the 26th of September. Visit the Festival of Biodiversity webpage for more details. Finally, if you want to support our local biodiversity, we hope you'll consider making a donation to NPARC's registered charity and IPC, Garden City Fund. 100% of your contribution will go into species recovery projects and other conservation, outreach and education programs to support our flora and fauna. You can make a donation at go.gov.sg slash give to FOB 2020 and this link will be sent in the chat soon. And this brings us to the end of today's session. Thank you to both Zestin and John for sharing with us and to our audience too for staying with us. We hope you enjoyed the session today. Do share your feedback by scanning the QR code on my screen. We hope to see you again at, at next week's talk, but till then, have a great weekend. Take care and stay safe.